All right, we've been uh, looking at uh, the valiant shepherd, David, um, as he came on the scene after Saul was uh, rejected. And uh, let's first, I'd like to go back a little bit and remind ourselves of the time period uh, that this is in. Um, this would be uh, around uh, 1010 is when David became the king, 1010 B.C., 1050 B.C. is when Saul became the king, so it's between 1050 and 1010. We don't know exactly how far into the reign of Saul that we are by now, but uh, we do know that Jonathan is a grown man. He's already stepped out on his own and, uh, and fought against the Philistines. Uh, we do know that uh, David is a teenager, and he wouldn't become king until he's probably an adult, uh, at about 30 years old, I would guess, at somewhere around there. So uh, I'd say we're at least halfway through Saul's reign or more. So uh, anyway, so 1030, 1025 B.C., uh, somewhere around that time period. Um, remember the 350 years of the judges in the land of Canaan, and then the, the United Kingdom begins, 1050, United Kingdom ends in uh, 930, which is at the end of Solomon's reign. And then the kingdom ends in 586 when Israel goes into captivity. I'm sorry, Ju Jerusalem goes into captivity, Judah. Uh, Israel went into captivity just 120 years before that. Okay, so we're around 1,000 B.C. That's an easy way to remember it. Uh, if, you, if you read about David... Uh, or I'm sorry, if you read the news about David, they're always trying to find some physical evidence that has the name David on it um, to prove that David was there before the Muslims. Um, it's usually about 1,000 B.C., uh, so 3,000 years ago. So you, you look at uh, some of the things that we believe were there at the time of David, uh, like the fortress... Uh, that David built on the site of the Jebusite fort. Um, if you look at uh, the palace, the, the, the foundation of the palace that is still there, that stepped stone structure that's there on the side of the hill, uh, they have found a lot of things just in the last five years proving that that is the, uh, I believe, proving that that's the site of David's palace. And uh, lots of other very interesting things right in there. But anyway, so it's not a thousand years before the time of Christ, 3,000 years ago. It's a long time. A lot of things have happened uh, in that area in 3,000 years. So anyway, we see uh, David, the valiant shepherd, as he makes his rise to take the throne. And so we're going to continue with that today by going to 1 Samuel chapter 17. And we're going to look at the signature moment the signature moment of the young man, the young shepherd boy, David. <clears throat> At this time, he hasn't been taken out of his home yet by the king to work for the king. Uh, he's still uh, living at home and he's obeying the orders of his father. He's not even old enough to be in the military. And I guess nowadays, uh, young uh, Israelites have to serve for two years in the military. And I think it's at 18 years old, but he wasn't even old enough to be in the military yet. His three oldest brothers were, uh, which puts him probably around 15 years old. David, a young man. He had three oldest brothers in the, in the army, and then three more brothers also at home still, and David's the youngest of all of those. So, 1 Samuel chapter 17, <clears throat> we see the Philistines making another attempt to attack Israel. This is basically the second major invasion or attempt at an invasion by the Philistines in the book of 1 Samuel. It, the first one we looked at was at Michmash. Now, that was a major Philistine attempt to take over Israel. They had oppressed them for a long period of time already. Remember the iron working and so on? They controlled that. And, and this is the second attempt. Uh, I, I brought a few pictures the last time we had class um, of the Valley of Elah. And uh, this, 
This valley is one of five or more, actually probably more, but they typically say five major inroads, valleys coming in from Philistine territory. Um, but this is the main one. And if you look at uh, the, the other battles later on, other battles, um, this is the same area. This is a very common area for the Philistines to try to attack from. Uh, Gath would be only a few miles away, the city of Gath. Uh, coming up through this valley brings you uh, in this way. This is the road, literally, that we took. As you can see this road here. This is the road that we took from Jerusalem to come out to Elah. Uh, it's a direct route into Jerusalem. And so I, I know David hadn't set up his, uh, his, his uh, capital at Jerusalem yet, but Jerusalem is the center. It's the high point of the country in the, in the middle area, not up north, but in the middle area. So if they can, if they can take Jerusalem and control it, they, they control the area around it. Anyway, so this is a very common uh, way to enter into the, the highlands, the central highlands of Israel is through this valley. The, the series of valleys are called the Shephelah. Um, it's a ser anyway, it's very obvious here, uh, as they can now see it from the sky. You can easily see these valleys leading in from the east. I'm sorry, from the west, bringing it in east. Okay? Um, did anybody not get a chance to look at these? Not much. Yes? Nobody else wants to look at them? I have two if you want to see them. So, All right. Pass it back. He wants, if you want to look at it, <clears throat> go right ahead. Anybody else? Nope. Okay. All right. So let's look at what happens here with this great iconic or a signature moment. Okay? 17 verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shoko, which belonged to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Azekah. <clears throat> um, and Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. Now, several things that happen here we would say are very odd in warfare. Uh, but it's very common back in these days to set your battle in array. So what do they do? What does that mean? Uh, you set up camp and you surround your camp with a trench or a wall. And uh, so your, your camp's surrounded. You've got all, a lot of soldiers lined up along that wall or along that trench. And, um, and then... And then you have a champion. In this case, it didn't always happen this way, but in this case, they had a champion who went out and challenged the other side to an individual fight with the understanding that whoever lost was supposed to submit or surrender themselves. <laughs> supposed to. Of course, that doesn't happen here, and I, I don't believe it often did. Uh, usually did not uh, work out that way. But, but so somebody would challenge to a fight, an individual fight. Thank you. <clears throat> what else uh, is, is very ancient times, very much uh, fitting with the times? Uh, they would have a shouting match. A great cry goes out of the bat or out of the camp. <clears throat> uh, in verse 8, we see Goliath uh, coming out and challenging them. Oh, let's see here. I, um, sorry. Where, where's the where's the shout? I missed it. I forgot to write it down. I guess. <clears throat> verse eight. Is it verse eight? Sin cried. Choose you a man. No. <clears throat> Verse 11 says, When Saul and all Israel heard these words, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. But, um, 17, verse 8. 17, 8. What? It says, When he stood and cried unto the army. Okay, but that's, that's just Goliath. I'm saying that there is a time here where they shout. Okay, verse 20. There we go. Ooh. And David rose up early in the morning, left the sheep with the keeper, and took and went as Jesse commanded him. He came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight. 
and shouted for the battle. Okay? Uh, why shout? There, there's other times where you see people in battle in the old times shouting. <laughs> I remember actually just before this when uh, Samuel, uh, yes, when Samuel was, they, was leading them to revival, basically. They were having a revival meeting. And uh, the children of Israel were, were gathering their soldiers together. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That was, that was another time. What I'm thinking of is when, when the Ark of the Covenant was brought out and a great shout went up. Remember, and the Ark was stolen by the Philistines. What, why did that happen? Uh, they, were, they were shouting to put fear into the enemy. The more people, you know, to me that's kind of like uh, junior church, you know, or uh, uh, camp, you know, where the teams shout at each other to put fear into each other's heart. shooting at each other from many, many miles away. So it's a very, very different concept of warfare. Uh, but this is ancient, shouting at each other to put fear into the hearts of, of the other soldiers. And it did work. Children of Israel are afraid and run and hide. Um, look at uh, verse uh, 16. And the Philistine drew near morning and evening, and presented himself forty days. So he comes out into the valley from their encampment, I'm assuming on the other side of, of, the, of the battlefield, of the valley, and the children of Israel would be on the closer side, and he comes out to the valley and challenges them to a fight. And he drew near. The Bible says that... Uh, uh, he came up, verse 25, in the middle of the verse, surely to defy Israel is he come up. So it looks like he literally came across the valley and came up onto their side. And they all turn and run and hide. <clears throat> all right? But notice what David does when he comes out there. I know the, the, the whole story, but... Uh, David comes out there and he says, uh, is there not a cause? Isn't there something worth fighting for? This guy is challenging us. The fact that you would have a, a, a challenge go forth like this is not unusual. But the fact that nobody would be there to meet that challenge is very unusual. Every uh, army had a, a warrior. Every army had a champion. And in Saul's army, they have no leadership. There's nobody there to say, okay, somebody's got to do something, I'll do it. They all turn and run. And uh, somehow David understood that there has to be a champion. Somebody has to speak up. And so David goes out and stands up himself. <clears throat> Uh, verse 22, David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran to the army and came to salute his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and speak according to the same words. And David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. Why were they afraid? Let's talk about Goliath a little bit. How big he was. All right? This ceiling, I didn't measure it beforehand, but uh, it is not as high as a basketball hoop. Okay, a basketball hoop is 10 feet, right? So uh, this ceiling is probably almost exactly the height of Goliath. It's more than, I, I, I can reach just to, almost to 8 feet. And so if uh, another foot and a half uh, puts it at nine and a half feet or so to the ceiling. That is about the height of Goliath. Okay, so if I'm standing next to him, <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm looking at his belt, or a little bit above his belt. Okay? He's a big guy. <clears throat> yeah read to you several things uh, about Goliath. Um, I wrote, uh, I have a whole page of things that describe him, so let me uh, give you those. Okay. 
<clears throat> Here we go. Nine feet nine inches, he was covered front and back by a coat of mail of brass consisting of scales overlapping each other, weighing not less than about 157 pounds. Now that's what he carried. Okay? So, <clears throat> a little bit more than that, but not much. About 10 pounds more than that. So he's carrying me everywhere he goes. Would you like to do that? <laughs> that's a big job. The armor no doubt descended to his legs, which were cased in greaves of brass, while a helmet of the same material defended his head. As weapons of offense he carried, besides the sword which he was girded, an enormous javelin of brass, after the manner of ancient soldiers, was slung on his back uh, with a string or a rope, and a spear, so a sword a javelin, and a spear. The metal head of the spear weighed about 17, 18 pounds. Just the head. <clears throat> okay. um, a huge, huge man. Uh, not just a, a big man, but the Bible says he was a warrior from his youth. When David goes to talk to Saul, uh, Saul said, no, no, you're just a youth. And he is a man of war from his youth. So uh, he's in his prime. And David, literally, I, mean, I can just imagine uh, a 15-year-old, just a skinny kid, you know, with a good attitude, but that doesn't help you in battle, necessarily. Um, but he's just a kid. And he goes out to fight this champion, and he had no chance. When Goliath meets David, he probably didn't bring down the helmet because he thought that David was unarmed. Okay? He came and said, What am I, a dog that thou comest to me with a, so a stick? You bring a stick, a staff, a shepherd's staff, out to fight me. So he probably didn't bring his helmet down, which would have protected his forehead when he was knocked in the head, of course. Um, he also, uh, what was the other thing? He also probably thought that David was, I'm sorry, he also is probably uh, nearsighted, where he couldn't see very well. Okay? I, uh, I've read that large, tall people um, often have eye trouble. The altitude. <laughs> the altitude, yes. <laughs> the heads in the clouds. Um, so I don't know if that's... But, but at the same time, if David is... It depends on how close David was. You know, the Bible doesn't tell us. But it does say that David ran to meet him. And he, he starts to swing the sling. The sling would have been made of two strings coming down with a pouch at the bottom for a rock. And as he's swinging this with both strings held, he releases one of the strings with his fingers, and the rock comes flying out. Now, you say, well, why didn't he dodge it? Now, I mean, that's what, because he was, he was partly blind or couldn't see very well, I've heard, I've read. Yes? I was watching something, they have, uh, in Israel, they have a sport. Uh, they Are you going to steal my thunder? Probably. Probably. Okay, go ahead. But anyways, yeah, like, like nowadays, uh, there's a guy, he's a professional, I guess, and he can get the stone up to 98 miles an hour. Oh, sure. Shoot. You can't see that. Now, David's a teenager, <laughs> so he probably wasn't that good. But we do know, and that's a very good point, I, I have something to add to that, so you didn't completely steal my <laughs> 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 no. <laughs> um, but we do know, uh, according to the book of Judges, that the tribe of Benjamin had 700 men who could sling stones at a hair breadth and not miss, the Bible says, and not miss. Say so, as, as difficult as it may sound, you know, Dustin Scalise has his uh, slingshot. That's the modern style of slingshot. 
And it's difficult, and I can't even comprehend it. You know, I, our God, when we were in Israel, we were in the Valley of Elah, uh, right down here next to this road. We were walking out here in the field. And um, uh, we read the story of David and Goliath. And, of course, me being who I am, I got to be uh, David. <laughs> and Dr. Mitchell, <laughs> he has got to be Goliath. And our guy had a sling. And he tried to, you know, we're all like, step back, you know. And he starts to swing that thing, and he released it, and the stone went that way. I mean, it's very hard for me to even comprehend how you can be accurate with that thing. Yes. Have you I done used it? to be able to get birds on is that right? <laughs> With that kind of a sling? See, there you go. So evidently, to me, it just seems almost impossible. And I've never practiced at all. But it just seems very hard to get your release point right as you're coming around. So, now as he's saying, uh, 98 miles an hour. I didn't hear that detail. But I've heard that if you have a little over an inch uh, in diameter size stone coming out of a sling, it can have the impact because it's bigger, it has the impact, or it can have, of a 45 uh, caliber bullet when it hits. <laughs> so it's not a joke that when that thing, you know, we don't know how big the rock was either. It's probably bigger than an inch. It's probably an inch and a half to two inches in diameter. Maybe not. But still, if that thing comes out at 80 miles an hour, or 60 miles an hour, and it hits a person, it's going to knock them down and at least stagger them. And of course, David, when, when he hits Goliath, he doesn't, that, the, the rock doesn't kill him. It hits his forehead and knocks him to the ground. He gave him a concussion, probably. <laughs> Knocked him to the ground, and he runs up, and he takes out the sword, and he cuts his head off. <laughs> okay? So, very interesting things. I have a, a book, I meant to bring it with me, called uh, Battles in the Bible. And there's two Jews... Uh, Jews, Israelites at least, I think they're Jews, that, uh, that put this book together. And they know Israel, the, the land very well, they live in Israel. And uh, they talk about this a little bit, actually not as much as I, I thought they would, but they, they go through just a lot of the battles of the Bible and explain them from a Jewish perspective, from the land's perspective, you know, understanding the land. So, very, very interesting. <clears throat> Let me give you some reasons why David was able to kill Goliath. <coughs> Story time is here. <coughs> time to take some notes. First of all, I'm going I'm to say that he was able to kill Goliath because he was faithful in little things. He was faithful in little things. What was he doing out there when he was watching the sheep? Was he sleeping? <laughs> Was he just uh, letting his responsibilities go by the wayside? No. We know several things he did. We know that he cared very much for his sheep. He was willing to sacrifice, or willing to give his life to kill a bear or an, and a lion that were going to take his sheep. So we know that he loved his sheep very much. Um, we've all been there. You guys are closer to it than I am because I'm older. But I remember as a teenager uh, being given jobs to do. And, uh, you know, Dad would leave and he'd say, I want you to check the fence line and fix any fence that needs fixed. And so I would go back in the woods and walk along the fence and I'd find about 15 other things to do as I'm walking along. <laughs> and, and not really paying attention very much, you know. And I'm fiddling around and I'm climbing the trees and I'm acting like I'm a cowboy shooting Indians. And I'm, there's just a million things to do out in the woods as a kid, you know. Uh, find some twine and make a bow and arrow and, you know, just, um, there's a thousand things to do. A million, not a thousand. <laughs> so, um, David, obviously, was very responsible. His faithful in all things. He cared for his sheep. We know that he, he played his harp. He learned to play the harp out there in the pasture. Uh, what does that do? What's, you know, is he just goofing? You saying, oh yeah, my, my harp lessons. I'm going to work on my harp lessons today. Why, why play the harp? Is there any practical reasons for that? Robert? Maybe a calming effect on the sheep, sure. No question. 
they hear that sound, they know that sound, it becomes something that calms them. Um, he, he was uh, faithful in, uh, oh, in, in uh, I believe, in practicing slingshots. Working with a slingshot. And I say little things, he's out there, he's not just doing nothing, he's practicing using these things, and probably as a little kid I can imagine, man, if a bear ever comes my way, I'm going to be ready, man. He's going to get a, a rock to the head, you know. And so he'd practice, and he'd have fun, and he'd set up these objects and try to hit them, and got real good at it, obviously. He was faithful in little things. Secondly, he was obedient to his father. He was obedient to his father. Chapter 17, verse 17, his dad said, Take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn and these ten loaves and run to the camp to thy brethren. An ephah. Okay? It'd be a big bag. It, it weighs 30, 40 pounds easy of flour. And ten loaves and run, and carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand, and look how thy brethren fare, and take their pledge. Okay, so his dad said, you carry about 40, 50 pounds worth of things, and run, get over there. And David goes from Bethlehem to the Valley of Elah, about eight to ten miles away. Okay? So he obeyed his father, and he was obviously very uh, diligent at his obedience. Third, he also sought God's glory. I think that's another reason he was able to uh, kill the giant. <clears throat> he sought God's glory, not his own. Chapter 17, verse 26, David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What should be done to the man that killed this Philistine? Hey, is there any glory I can get for this? It's not what he's saying. And taketh away the reproach from Israel, for who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? David said, this just plain is not right, that our great country, our people of God, are being reproached by this heathen Philistine. <clears throat> No, it's a little bit difficult for us to understand again. This is an attack. In the old days, when, when a country attacked another country, an army attacked another army, they're attacking in the names of their gods. And so whoever wins, supposedly their gods are stronger. I mean, that's just the way everybody understood this. And so uh, anywhere you look throughout the Old Testament, you'll see that. Um, who was the, the king Ahaz, I believe it was? in the northern kingdom, many years later, he went to Syria, conquered them, and then made a copy of their God and brought it back and worshipped it. And everybody, of course, I'm sure, said, what in the world are you doing? You defeat their God, that's the way they looked at it, you defeat their God, and then you bring him and worship him. You want to lose? <laughs> you know, their God just lost, and here you're worshiping their God. So, David is seeking the glory of God in defending his, uh, his country, his army. Fourth, he was willing to endure criticism. He was willing to be misunderstood. <clears throat> See that in verse 28? Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. Here David is speaking to the men around him. These are men. He's a boy, 15 or so. He's speaking to the men. Eliab heard when he spake unto the men. Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? Boy, I missed your attitude here, right? Mm -hmm. Few sheep. I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, What have I not done? Is there not a cause? I almost wonder if Eliab is a little jealous. I think Eliab and his brothers might be a little jealous. They know the secret. You know, King Saul doesn't even know the secret. Not many people, I'm sure, know the secret. 
But Eliab knows the secret. You are just, you know you're going to be the king someday, so you're trying to get some brownie points ahead of time. I know that pride. So, he's willing to be misunderstood. Another thing he did is he was willing to take on a hard job, a difficult task. He took on a difficult task. Chapter 17, verse 31. And 32, when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. I don't know, probably, in, in those days, kings went to battle with the soldiers. And so he probably had his own tent, you know, a makeshift tent set up, and he stayed there, and they brought David to that tent. It wasn't like they took, you know, David back to, you know, Gibeah or wherever Saul had normally stayed at. So they bring him to Saul's tent, verse 32, and David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him, Goliath. Thy servant will go and fight this Philistine. <laughs> you know, here's Saul. Remember how tall he is? And here's little kid David. He says, Thy servant, I'll go fight this big old giant. I'll show him. And Saul's like, yeah, okay. Big talking little kid here. Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said to Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his tail. No. <laughs> I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. I went right after him, right in the face. Yes? If he had a sling, why didn't he use it? I'm, I, it doesn't say that he didn't. He just like caught him and Yeah, but when, because the animal turned on him, so he could have easily used it to, to get the lion's attention, and the lion turns on him, and then he catches the lion and kills him. Well, it just says it already had one of his lambs, so he's probably trying to get the lamb back. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. Do you think you, like, what, broke the lamb's neck? Like, how did he kill it? I don't know what he's This is the discussion we had last, last time we had class. Uh, was the Spirit of God upon him? Right. Um, I don't think he did like Samson. He just took it and just ripped it apart. <laughs> but he, he obviously, he grabbed it by the beard and he, and he hit it real hard and he dazed it or something until he was able to, to kill it. So. All right. And Saul's still not quite convinced. <laughs> Saul said, okay, that's good. But this isn't even a lion and a bear. This is a person, you know. <coughs> Yes. And didn't Saul know him already? Well, that's the that's a great question. Um, a lot of people wonder if uh, some of these stories are out of order. Um, like Saul, like this is the first run in that Saul has with David, and that then later, I'm sorry. If you go back to chapter 16, when the story of, of David playing his heart for Saul, it's like they already knew about David. And so, I, I don't know, I, I've wondered if the end of chapter 16 is just saying that when Saul got that problem of the Spirit of God leaving him and going to David, like it talks about earlier in chapter 16, that that actually happened after chapter 17 when they knew about David already. So, to me, it's not a real problem uh, that it just says the Spirit of God left Saul, they knew about David, so they asked him to come, but that actually happened later. The story of, of chapter 17 happened first. I don't really have a problem with that. But. Um, Jared? Oh, sorry, that's Jared. <laughs> well, when... Uh... The spirit of God left Saul, and the evil spirit came on him during David's anointing, and that was before he took Goliath. So wouldn't that have placed this before? Well, the Bible talks about, or it says how uh, um, the spirit of, <coughs> when David was anointed, the spirit of God was upon him, and in the same time when it says that, it left Saul, and there was an evil spirit on Saul. 
And that was before David's death. Okay. I don't, it doesn't say it was the same time, I don't think. Mm -hmm. Verse uh, 14, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Um, I mean, obviously the Spirit of the Lord can be in more places than one, but um, yeah, well, I really just, wonder... Just in the context, it kind of seems like it's all at the same time. So, okay. It, it seems that way, but I don't think it has to. Okay. Because of the fact that David... Uh, uh, where is it? Um, I think it's actually later in chapter 17. Yes, verse 56. Chapter 17, 56. And the king said, Inquire thou whose son this stripling is. And as David returned from the saw of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul at the head of the Philistine. In his hand, Saul said, Whose son art thou, thou young man? I am the son of thy servant Jesse the Bethlehemite. Yeah. Saul definitely acts like he didn't know him. So I, I really thought that it's a good chance that what happens at the end of chapter 16 is just finishing the thought of the Spirit of God leaving Saul going to David and leaving Saul, but that that actually happened later on. Yes? Yeah, I was going to say, in verse 16, towards the end, it said, uh, uh, in verse 21 of chapter, of chapter 16, it said he became his armor bearer. So he probably lived in the palace at that time. And then it comes back to chapter 17, where he has to actually go to battle from his house. And so, you know, if he's lived yes. in the palace before, why yes. would he have to come from Which is another... That's a very good point. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> anyway, I don't know that that's the case, but it, there, there's a lot of debate over why Saul didn't know David. And to me, that answers the question, at least helps us answer that question. Okay. <clears throat> and then, chapter 18, verse 1, we, I think, we at this point now have David going to live in the palace. Jonathan loved David. Saul took him that day in verse 2 and would let him go no more home to his father's house. You are going to be in the palace and you're going to play your heart for me. So, to me, it just, and who knows how much time went by. All of this would have taken time to go home and get your things. You know, anyway, so. Okay, he took on a difficult task. I didn't finish my, uh, my reasons why he's able to kill Goliath. I want to give you one more reason I think is very, very important. He used <coughs> familiar weapons. He used familiar weapons. Saul tried to arm David with his armor. I mean, number one, he's twice as tall as David, you know, or at least as the... Yeah, it's not close to that, but I guess. Uh, so David's a short kid, and he's got on this huge armor. doesn't work. Uh, David had never tried on armor before, except when he was, you know, a kid at a birthday party. <laughs> not kids do at birthday parties where they, they try on things that don't fit them. You ever do that as a kid? I do. Try on my parents, my, my dad's clothes, and coats, you know, and boots. My kids do that with my boots. Uh, he had never done that before with the armor. And so he, he walks out of the tent and he just, <laughs> I'm not used to this. He says, just give me what I'm familiar with. Well, what, what kind of uh, sword have you been working out with? Uh, no sword. What kind of javelin or spear have you been throwing? Uh, neither. Well, what do you use? You know, a BB gun? <laughs> no, not even a BB gun. Um, I use... A, a uh, slingshot, and I'm good with it, and I'm effective with it. Um, you know, you can't be somebody else. You can't. You're going to have to kill the giants in your own life with who God made you and with what God gave you. Uh, you know, some people, some preachers, they teach their young followers, their young students, to preach like them. Well, that's ridiculous. Uh, we're different. Everybody's different. Uh, for years, that's been a philosophy going around our country, independent Baptist. Everybody wants to be like the, this big-name preacher, which is, you know, 
I don't read that in the book of, or in the New Testament, where all the, you know, Timothys and the Onesimuses and all these guys, where they're all trying to preach like the Apostle Paul. Okay? God gave you specific weapons and use those and be good with them. There's nothing good be with being, there's nothing wrong with being good with what God gave you. You should. But at the same time, you don't try to be somebody else. He used familiar, proven weapons. Okay. <clears throat> so we see David and Goliath as uh, part of the valiant shepherd. All right, next, that brings us then to the jealousy of Saul. The jealousy of Saul. And uh, we're going to finish this today in chapter 18. <clears throat> and then... Uh, 18 and 19 actually and then uh, that will bring us up to David's flight um, and we see a lot of his uh, fleeing uh, from the jealous King Saul the jealousy of Saul chapters 18 and 19 Saul becomes jealous and tries to kill David through these two chapters or not through these two because of what happens in these two chapters uh, Saul is going to try to kill David repeatedly <clears throat> Um, before that, or at the beginning of chapter 18, we see Jonathan and David becoming friends, and David rising in the ranks, David's uh, popularity growing, and the reasons for Saul's jealousy. So no, first of all, the reasons for Saul's jealousy. <clears throat> the first reason is because his own son was closer to David than to his father. came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that Saul, Jonathan, was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Why would you think that Jonathan would love David so much? I know there's a very obvious reason, I think. He's just humble. Okay. Yes. He wasn't trying to throw javelins at him. <laughs> he was nice to him, right? No. Anybody else? They both accomplished major feats. Okay. Continue that thought. What had they both done? Trust in the Lord. That's very true. Robert? Um, Jonathan went with his armor bearer and slayed the Philistines, David had killed Goliath. So they both basically one on one. They both had really stepped out and attack the Philistines basically by themselves. David by himself. So they, they have a common bond. Boy, uh, they, they both, and it's more than just, you know, we both attack the Philistines. They both were of the same mindset that if God is with us, then nothing can stop us. Let's do it. Let's go. Uh, I'm telling you, these guys are two of a kind. <clears throat> I've done some studying on Jonathan, and I'm just convinced that Jonathan was a great, great man. A great general, leader of the army, um, a great son. He was a great friend. Uh, he, he, in so many ways, typifies the type of uh, son that I want to raise. Jonathan, a great man. Um, so... Saul becomes jealous because of David's rising popularity. Um, he was uh, a good friend to Jonathan. He also was a great soldier. Another reason for Saul's jealousy. He became a great soldier. <clears throat> Verse 5, David went out whithersoever Saul sent him and behaved him so wisely that Saul set him over the men of war. Now, Here's where I said that we don't know how much time went by. This is not a month after he killed Goliath. Saul did not, I, I guarantee you, he did not put a 15-year-old over his soldiers. Okay, you understand that? There, there has to be some time that went by here. Uh, in, ver in chapter 17, he calls him a stripling. That means literally just a young boy, a strapping, but a very young child, a, a teenager, 
Who's, who's is this kid? And now he sets him over the men of war. He, he's, this is not a month later. <laughs> okay, he's, he's a young man by this time. <clears throat> he's, he's old enough to be married. Okay, because he gets married soon after this. Came to pass, they came, verse 6. I'm sorry, did I finish verse uh, 5? He sent him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Now, see, well, well, you know, he's accepted. They acknowledge that he's worthy. Everybody recognized that there's something special about David, including Saul's own servants, except for one. Do it. And the one who did not like it. Came to pass as they came when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women came out of all cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tabrets, with joy, and with instruments of music. And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul hath slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. <laughs> He's popular. I don't believe. Uh, singing, singing naturally tends to glorify something. Okay? So Saul slaying his thousands is probably not a literal statement. David slaying ten thousands is probably not a literal statement. If David, I mean, how many soldiers of the Philistines were there? You know, if thousands is plural, so if David slew 20,000 Philistines himself, uh, obviously, anyway, there's, no, there's nobody else for anybody else to kill. <laughs> you know, there's no other soldiers for any yeah. other Israelites to kill. This is, this is a glorification, uh, this is a glorification showing the popularity of David versus King Saul. Now, before you go and say, yeah, Saul got jealous of that, you would too. Yeah. <laughs> okay? right, that would be very hard to swallow. You know, I'm the king, I'm the tall guy, I'm the leader, I organize the army, and he gets all the credit for it. Yes? Um, I've read that in Jewish poetry that 10,000 is kind of symbolic for the largest number you can describe. Yeah. So it's almost like in infinite. You know, that they're saying just he's slain infinitely more than Saul. <laughs> yes. That's a good point. <clears throat> All right. Um, verse 8. Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him, so he becomes very jealous. They have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed a thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? Exactly. <laughs> Everybody knows it. Uh, <coughs> Anyway, that's the next step. Everybody knows that the only thing, you know, who, who becomes a leader, who becomes a king? It's usually a general. And, and this is very common. The Romans, uh, I forget, oh, I get the names all mixed up, but uh, Roman generals, when they came back to Rome, uh, they were very, the, the emperor was very suspicious of them. Okay? Especially if they are successful, <laughs> which often happen. Crossing of the Rhine. You stay out there with your army. You come any closer, you cross the Rhine River, and we're going to assume that you are have become an enemy. Hmm. Okay, That's exactly what often happened. Yes? I was thinking, from measuring this from David's perspective, he knows he's going to be the king. Yes. He's getting popular, and he might be expecting that God might put him as the king, and then all of a sudden he's chased out by Saul. And he's ready for his life. So you can imagine where all the songs might have come from. Yes. And that the question I that, thought it was going to be the king. Yes. At this point, but now God's taking me through this. Sure. The questions that he had about what God was doing, no, no doubt about that. <clears throat> all right, so then let's see Saul's rage. You see that the, some of the reasons for his jealousy, Jonathan, David's popularity. And so now we see the rage of Saul, and I want to point out through the next several chapter, or next this chapter and the next, five attempts 
by King Saul to kill David. I'm not talking about when they're fleeing. I'm not we're not even there yet. We're not talking about when uh, David's hiding in the cave. We're talking when David was in the palace of King Saul, there are at least five attempts to kill him. I used to, when I was a kid, I thought there were two. You know, one where he threw the javelin at him, and another time when he was in the bed. Uh, and there's actually, there's three more than that. Look at chapter 18, verse 10. It came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house. And David would play with his hand as at other times. Now you see this reference to what I think happened in chapter 16. Where David came to play his harp. Uh, that had been already spoken of in chapter 16. And there was a javelin in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the javelin for he said I will smite David even to the wall with it. So he throws the javelin. Now notice the end of the verse. And David avoided out of his presence twice. So here in this verse, we see two attempts, two different times. Saul throws a javelin, and if you can just imagine, you know, a javelin, I've, I've thrown knives and different things, and when they stick, what is there? There's always that shake. You know, the back end of the javelin shaking real. Saul's a big man, he's a strong man, and he throws a javelin, he can throw it with force, and it sticks. And David dodges out of the way, and there's the boom right next to his ear. Uh, he took off running, and he went too. Um, so this happens twice here in verse 11. That's the first and the second attempts by Saul to kill David. Verse 12, and Saul was afraid of David because the Lord is with him and has departed from Saul. Therefore Saul removed him from him and made him his captain over a thousand. Didn't he? He used to be over all the men of war. He was the general. Now he's a captain over a thousand. So he got very much, he got demoted. He came in, he went out and came in before the people. He continued as before. He behaved himself wisely. Going out and coming in means your, your actions no, on a normal basis. He kept on doing the same things. Verse 15, Wherefore when Saul saw that he behaved himself very wisely, he was afraid of him. There's twice now it says he was afraid of David. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. Saul said to David, Behold my elder daughter Merah, her will I give thee to wife. Only be thou valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. Um, verse 19, But it came to pass at the time when she, his daughter, should have been given to David, she was given unto somebody else. And Michelle, Michael, Michelle, yeah, I think it's the same word. Saul's daughter loved David, and they told Saul the thing pleased him. He said, oh, I'll, I'll give you my other daughter. All you have to do is kill 100 Philistines. And so David said, oh, that's a good dowry. I'll do that. So he goes around and kills 200 <laughs> Philistines. Okay? Um, verse 28, Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David, and that Michelle, Saul's daughter, loved him. And Saul was yet the more afraid. Three times he's afraid of David. Um, so this, I'm calling this, the third attempt to kill David is when he, he plans on having the Philistines get rid of David. He said there's no way he's going to kill 100 Philistines. They'll kill him. Could that have been what he meant by uh, his daughter being a snare to him? Yes, yes. He, he, he expected that David would die trying to get a wife, trying to <laughs> find, get a dowry to get his, his daughter a wife. It's interesting here, an interesting comparison. Here's David sent out, I don't know if I have a specific point, but I just thought it's interesting, that David is sent out to do battle expecting and he was expected to get killed. David, later on, does the same thing and sends a man to battle, expecting to get him killed, and it did work. 
Um, anyway. So that's the third attempt. There's a fourth attempt. Chapter 19, verse number 10. Verse 9, the evil spirit of the Lord was upon Saul as he sat in his house with a javelin in his hand and David played with his hand. I'm sure by this time, the Bible says that the javelin is in Saul's hand. And I'm sure by this time, David wasn't just sitting there, you know, with his side to Saul, just kind of lollygagging and playing the harp. Now he kept his eyes glued. <laughs> you know, he's playing the harp and he's watching all the time, watching. And sure enough, verse 10 Saul sought to smite David even to the wall with the javelin, but he slipped away out of Saul's presence, and he smote the javelin into the wall, and David fled and escaped that night. He goes to his house. So that's the fourth attempt. And then the fifth attempt is in verse 11 through 17. Saul also sent messengers unto David's house to watch him and to slay him in the morning. And Michal, David's wife, told him, saying, If thou save not thy life tonight, tomorrow thou shalt be slain. So Michal let David down through a window, and he went and fled and escaped. Michal took an image and laid it in the bed and put a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster and covered it with a cloth. She faked him out. When Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, He is sick. So Saul sent the messengers again to see David, saying, Bring him up to me in the bed, that I may slay him. And the messengers would come in, and behold, there was an image in the bed of the pillow of goat's hair for his bolster. And Saul said unto Michelle, Why hast thou deceived me? You tricked me. I was trying to kill your husband, and you didn't let me. <laughs> <laughs> and sent away mine enemy, that he is escaped. And Michelle answered Saul, He said unto me, Let me go. Why should I kill thee? So David fled and escaped, came to Samuel to Ramah. Weird family situation. That to me is the weirdest part about this. Is you know he speaks to his daughter like she's still living in his house and his you know would, would side with him instead of her husband. You know you tricked me. I was trying to kill your husband. You you tried to help him instead of me. Well, of course, you know that's the way I look at it. I'm sure. So Saul's rage, and then this leads to the next obvious phase of the life of David, <clears throat> and that is his flight from Saul. His flight from Saul. Um, it's a necessary, difficult life, uh, part of the life of David. Uh, very necessary. Uh, God was preparing David. Uh, there was no question. We know that in hindsight. Because we have the book of Psalms that the vast majority of it was written during this time period. Uh, seven years, as Rick mentioned, seven years of, not seven years, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, but obviously several years of questions and seeming like God had forgotten his promises. You anointed me, now what's going on? I'm about to get killed here. And yet he learns to trust in the Lord, and he learns uh, to wait for God's timing. Um, in the time that I've left, I just want to address the idea of, of God's timing through all of this. God was working, but it wasn't evident. And David had to learn to be patient and wait for God's timing. Jonathan knew that David was going to be the king. At the end of chapter 19, no, in a different place, actually, later on, next chapter, I believe, uh, Jonathan says to David, I know, I know you're going to be the king someday. That was Jonathan's position. Jonathan is the son of a king. That would mean he'd be the next one in line to be the king. And Jonathan says, I know I'm not going to be the king. I know you are going to be the king. Uh, later on, they come to the wilderness of Ziph, and Jonathan sneaks out and meets David and says, I know you're going to be the king. Jonathan knew that all along. And he never saw him again after that. He died. Jonathan, of course, killed in battle. But, uh, they had to learn patience. David had learned patience. And Jonathan learned forbearing or, or giving, giving up something that he should have been able to claim, humanly speaking. 
Uh, he was willing to give that up. So it's a great lesson for us. And again, I say Jonathan's a great man. Uh, he was a godly man, trusted the Lord, and is a courageous man, uh, willing to go to bat. All right, we'll stop there for today, for today, for today.